Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Paradigm Show, where we talk about micro markets as well as macro markets. Today with me, of course, I have our ever-present co-host, David, the macro man. Um, hello, David. Nice to see you again. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and in fact, I took a shot at is you last week, too, because you've missed two shows, but I know it's for good reason. Uh, so... <laughs> on on Jonathan, that note, you have to introduce yourself properly. <laughs> yeah, you, you have to introduce yourself again because people have forgotten who you are by this point. But no, our other co-host, Joe, uh, welcome back. I, I hope you had a great time in the Bahamas while we were here <laughs> working away. Well, I mean, clearly I wasn't on a beach very much. I mean, I'm looking at myself into the screen. I look as pasty as I was when I left, right? So, you look yeah. great. A lot, a lot of work, not a lot of play, unfortunately. Yeah. But. <laughs> Who takes vacations in crypto anyway? That's a myth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, today we have with us Gordon from Genesis. Um, very happy to have you on. Uh, if you could give us a little bit of background, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. Pleasure. Well, greetings, everyone. Good morning. It's um, very much a privilege to sit down with the guys at Paradigm, um, you know, as, as uh, we've made mention in many sort of public discussions in the, in the past and tweets from Genesis. We're very uh, proud to, to be executing and transacting and, and to be one of the largest market makers on the Paradigm platform. Um, you know, Genesis is, a, is an institutional uh, crypto broker dealer and derivatives market maker. My background is in um, quantitative finance and econometrics. Um, I've pretty much been trading options since I was 20 years old. I started right out of college, um, graduated from a an accredited New Jersey state institution and, and uh, went to the buy side and, and did macro volatility and, and ran a large book of risk with a, a bulge bracket hedge fund for about 10 years before getting into crypto. Made my way to Genesis in 2021 and have really been quite impressed, I would say, at, at the depth and breadth of this market and, and um, you know, the, I would say that the quality of, of the institutional grade trading tools that are out there, including Paradigm. So I'll kick it back to you guys and we can probably get into some more details about the market and how we're thinking about things coming into this, you know, slightly akimbo ambiance at, at you know, still the early days of 2023. Um, actually, I have a question before we get into, before we get into like the vol and all that, um, how did you make that transition? Why did you make that transition from what you were doing before into crypto? Sure. Yeah. So, um, look, you know, the, the macro volatility environment had a, a pretty incredible run from, I would say the post nine 11 era, right through the global financial crisis, kind of into the taper tantrum. Um, but, but then, you know, the regulation of hedge funds and, uh, and I would say the kind of dissemination of information about trading volatility products and stuff like Forex and commodities took a lot of the edge away. Um, and it, it became far less appetizing to do that kind of, uh, of business and, um, you know, tail risk type trades, which obviously paid out in, in, um, in 08 and, and again, sort of in 11 started to be serial underperformers as systematic vol selling came into play. So when I discovered crypto by random chance in 2013 at a Formula One event, of course, where does someone discover crypto? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I sort of picked it up and, and ran with it, um, you know, got involved as, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as an investor, as, as an advisor and an independent trader and arbitrage or a crypto enjoyer, if you will. And, you know, I more or less operated independently for, for the better part of, um, you know, six or seven years. And I, I really always felt that there was basically no reason to do kind of a real day job in crypto unless it was doing institutional trading of options, right? Because I know what that takes, what that looks like, what sorts of venues one needs. And um, I, I was, you know, bopping around the Middle East and, and um, Europe at that time. And um, all of a sudden it sort of came to my radar that there was this thing called Deravid and that there was actual um, institutional grade crypto trading taking place. So uh, Kind of shipped myself back to the states at the time of the pandemic, and um, and you know connected with uh, one of the former principals of the trading business at Genesis when I was pursuing some graduate studies at Columbia in uh, in data science. One thing led to another, and um, you know I just started running a bunch of data scientific um, you know tasks and and research oriented projects within crypto space, focusing on some of the same stuff that that's come out in, in recent work by, by Amber data and others about spot volatility, correlation, volatility regimes, term structure, service arbitrage and, and the like. Um, and, you know, I, I pretty much decided at that time that there really wasn't anything else worth doing uh, in derivative space besides trading um, crypto. Uh, so, so that's really the, the origin of the, 
the transition from you know kind of a an independent sort of crypto nomad to um, you know getting back in a seat again and, and trading institutional uh, vol. That's that's funny because I actually dove down the rabbit hole of crypto at a Formula One event as well at, in Singapore in 20, 2018. So that's right. Yeah, it's, it's the uh, it's it's the gateway, uh, just the yeah. gateway, not not a gateway anything else, just the gateway. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah, it, it's quite it's quite fascinating, kind of kind of hearing your background, having the traditional macro um, experience, and then coming into crypto. It's it's very funny, you know, when I made the jump. Uh, into the space professionally about a year ago, you know, going back and speaking to my former colleagues at, at JP Morgan or Deutsche Bank, like, it's very funny speaking to them. They're like, wait, this is a market. This exists. You know, you're telling me, you're telling me one month, like 25 Delta calls don't trade 10 vols wide. And you know, that people actually will put on a trade that's over like a couple million notional. Yeah. What? Like, this is insane. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's, over time, increasingly, you know, we're going to hear more and more stories um, like Gordon. And of course, Gordon, you know, he's the governor. He's the he's the OG in in the space. And we're, we're very, very lucky to have him as a partner. Yeah, I think, appreciate well, that like, feedback. I think that's true, yeah. right? Like there is always this surprise factor. Sorry. Yeah, oh. no, I, I was going to say as well, like coming from the macro side myself and um, sort of from FX options and what have you and. I think that's one of the things that if I think about sort of slight changes over the past year or so, and when I'm having conversations, it's kind of moving people past that, you know, the, the no coiners who kind of go, oh, Bitcoin is, is just uh, this Ponzi scheme or what have you, to actually talking about some of the stuff we're doing. And then when the penny drops, I, uh, you know, oh shit, you know, that that's kind of, you know, these derivative structures that you're overlaying on this is what, what we've been doing for years. And then they start to think and see the opportunities. And yeah, and as you say, to know that, you know, this stuff isn't trading 10 vols wide, there's a real market in it and, you know, institutional grade uh, infrastructure to trade this stuff. Um, I, I've definitely noticed more people getting interested to to start looking at this and taking the space seriously. It's interesting. Yeah, and it's, you know, David, you, you make a, an excellent point and you're obviously from a Forex background. I, I would say, Crypto is like, it's one of these places where you, you kind of, you go to some kind of social event or some soiree or gala to the extent that those exist anymore post COVID. And, you know, you find out all of a sudden that you, you know, a surprising number of people who are all at this wonderful party, right? And, and they may have been your liquidity providers at a bank. They may have been your peers at another hedge fund. They may have, um, they may too have been at that, that, gateway formula one event of, of years past, right? It's, it's a little bit of a, um, you know, society of the initiated, uh, and, and a coalition of the willing to step in every day and, and trade volatility in these markets. But I think it's because this is perhaps the most intriguing vol market that I've ever seen. Right. So I, I, you know, for a little bit more background, I started out trading EM Forex options, right? So I showed up day one, 2005 at, at my job, even before I graduated, and they you know, gave me a bunch of material to read and said, this is the Mexican local interest rate swap curve, and these are the new swaptions on this, and we, we want you to build um, you know, a, a stochastic volatility model that you know, appropriately maps this surface, because there were like options, and Banamex was quoting them and all that stuff, and, and that at the time was super interesting, and then it became super commoditized, right? Um, I was just talking to some colleagues this morning about trading you know, Peruvian inflation linked local currency denominated bonds against, um, you know, dollar offshore NDFs, right? Like that was exotic at the time and there was good edge, but that's all been done now, right? I mean, that, that trade is literally done or literally, you know, 50 billion of assets chasing those same trades. So if you want to do anything, I believe it's kind of quantitatively robust and you come from that discipline, um, you know, crypto, you know, crypto is where it's at. And I, I often say sort of jokingly in many of our chats, right? Like, the space of crypto vol traders is very much one that, that still kind of adheres to the way I feel to sort of an, an old set of codes, right? And we often say in the chat, like, there's a, there's a Bushido, you know, there's a way of the warrior. Um, because it's, it's such a brutal asset class, right? The, and, and it's such a brutal silo of volatility in terms of how fast the regimes flip, how big the swings are in volatility, how aggressive some of the flows can be. And, um, you know, you really have to be centered, based, if you will, I think, to, to kind of, you know, keep yourself, um, 
sort of centered in, in this zero G environment and, and make reasonable decisions about risk management and trading. Um, you know, the old saw, of course, is that Wall Street in general, if you don't know who you are, it's an expensive place to find out. In crypto ball, I would say, if you don't know who you are, right, this, this is sort of a, a, a potentially fatal place to find out. But, but that's what makes it fun, um, without question. That's what makes it fun. Isn't it? Yeah. And public service announcement for all the Trad5 Vol players that uh, want to give it a shot, but not take away all the edge. <laughs> Here's your invitation. <laughs> exactly. Um, on, on that note, Joe, if you could go over some flows and maybe some vol with us. Yeah, right yeah, absolutely. Well, Gordon's been in the thick of it, so it's going to be good discussion here. So just to start, so back sure. in December, so when the crypto option volumes in December, as, as Gordon can attest to, it was so dire. The market was just was absolutely awful, right? No, nobody was trading. Everybody was scared of FTX, blah, blah, blah. So we ran this inner dealer option flow analysis uh, that was actually lucky, lucky enough to be featured on Coindesk. And there's going to be a link in the description of the video below. So you can, you can check out that article. But ju just to recap, so in December, the buy side taker interest that we saw, so like family offices, high net worth individual, hedge funds, it got absolutely obliterated in the aftermath of FTX. And then you also had seasonal effects uh, into the end of the year. You know, just, you know, performance was bad. People were, were just cutting their losses and just waiting for January. So we wanted to quantify that and see how much of the paradigm flow was actually just market makers trading against other market makers, which I'm sure Gordon has opinions on. It probably is not the best way to make money. So but the main takeaway was that in December, the inner dealer option flow as a percentage of paradigm volume was easily at 2022 highs. So you see that jump in that chart up to the 45%. It was absolutely brutal, the market. And we ended that podcast by asking the question, are buy side takers going to jump back into the pool in Q1? And boy, have they. You know, we've discussed this on the previous couple episodes, you know, large takers FOMOing into this rally, you know, starting with the large outright calls, and then now the and now we're seeing more and more of these calls call spreads. So we re-ran that inner dealer option flow analysis and the percentage of paradigm flow now occurring between only market makers is back down to the healthy median levels, which we saw throughout the past of, um, throughout the rest of 20 to 22, which was at that median was 28%. And this is right around 30. And sure, it's the result we expected, you know, given how busy the past couple of weeks were for us, but it's always good to, I guess, to back it up with that data. So, Gordon, a question I'll pose for you is, you know, what's your thought on real interest coming back to the market? Is, is this just a result of, okay, spot rally and people FOMOing in? Like, is it here for good? Is it going to be, you know, just dependent on spot? I, I feel that that is highly likely, that there is an extreme degree of, of spot ball correlation and spot volume correlation and spot ball volume correlation, right? Um, there's been a lot of work, research-related work about reflexivity in, in crypto markets. I think the first time I read what I would consider to be a somewhat erudite piece about um, reflexivity was, uh, was in Q4 of 2020. Um, Eric Peters at One River, who uh, I think has been a, a pretty solid voice for crypto adoption at an institutional level and, and sort of looking at some of the distributional benefits of the addition of crypto to a portfolio, talked a lot about it at the time. And that was when Bitcoin was really ramping up, um, you know, from, from the mid to low teens and, and on its way to breaking through 20 and, and a huge historical bull run. Um, the derivatives market at times also exhibit, exhibits that same kind of reflexivity. And I think that's, that's in full force here, right? So why is that, right? So if you think about it, what we saw to close out the year was prices low for coins, volatility low, both in realized and, and implied, and volumes low. Um, and, and that has a lot to do with, one, people just really kind of left the asset class for dead. And there was a lot of thought process that, well, I just don't want to be in it. I want to wait. I want to see if there are better opportunities, whatever the case may be. But it's also just a function of the pure arithmetic on balance sheets in the asset class, which is to say, essentially, um, you know, when you talk about coin-denominated derivatives markets, which is derivative, which is what we're all trading, people's ability to have deployable collateral or assets to spend premium on is oftentimes a function of how high those coin prices are. 
And, and so when we found ourselves down at 15, 16 K Bitcoin and, and ETH kind of languishing around 12, 1300, people just didn't have a lot of firepower, right? To make bets and, and no willingness to do it. But yet, as soon as prices ramp up, you have higher coin prices, greater ability to deploy capital, greater ability to margin positions or, or take bets, plus that sort of psychological self-fulfilling prophecy of higher vol, higher volumes, um, higher prices, and, and that kind of virtuous feedback loop. So there is likely to be that sort of persistent relationship, um, I, I find, right? And, and that's one of the reasons why I think when you start to look at the performance of SKU, right, the, the realization of, um, you know, sort of sticky delta or, or sticky strike volatility regimes, and to what extent, you know, we're, we're looking at um, a distribution of returns that resembles, um, you know, past practices for crypto, you really need to think about it almost in kind of a Markovian sense, right? Because there are clearly times where higher levels of, of crypto pricing will bring materially lower levels of implied volatility. And that has to do with, let's say, minor dynamics or call overriding flows or what have you. But coming off a bottom that was, I would say, as desperate, right, as, um, you know, as, as kind of utterly languishing as, as the December lows were for, for spot and especially vol. Um, you know, we've, we've seen this reflexive bounce, right? And that's where you're getting a huge amount of taker involvement that um, is clearly going to persist at higher prices. I mean, from our own metrics, just looking roughly at paradigm statistics, which, which is easy for us to talk about on here, um, you know, we, we saw our volumes basically triple, right? From the first two weeks of January now to, um, to the back end of January. And that's not a surprise. And that has to do with exactly as you say, right? The dealer to dealer, um, you know, sort of two guys fishing for, for one fish in the same pond and, and hooking their lines against each other all of a sudden became this sea replete with, um, you know, sort of happily participating takers, not to say indiscriminate, but happily participating takers who have a view and, and are willing to deploy their balance sheet again because a $22,000 Bitcoin, it's a very different world than 16000 Absolutely. And I just want to go back to your point on reflexivity very quickly. There's a lot of talk in, in the crypto vol market of like actually how, you know, dollar, dealer dollar gamma exposure, like how that actually matters, which I think maybe we, we discussed this, Gordon, like four or five months ago, how like a market that is so small compared to the size of its spot. Of course, you hear about, you know, dealer gamma positioning and, you know, S&P options and, and equity options in general quite a lot. But given how small this market is, there's certainly a lot of talk around, oh, like, People, you know, people, when we have these rallies kind of like point to things, right? It's like, okay, yeah, it's, you know, technically driven because of the liquidations. And then, oh, yeah, we had all this crazy buying, upside buying pre-CPI, which, you know, got dealers short gamma. And then that is fueling that reflexivity and fueling that rally. Like, how much do you think that that is, that is actually a thing and was a driver for these higher coin prices? Yeah, um, gamma, gamma counts more so for this market than, than almost any other. Um, Part of what I spent my macro life doing was, was trading a significant amount of precious metals volatility, particularly markets like silver from 2009 to, to 2012. And that market was one in which you saw the re-engagement of the institutional investor and, and perhaps, you know, more of the dedicated buy side, um, you know, tradfi transactor. Crypto feels, um, feels a bit like that, which is to say... Open interest at a specific strike can count for almost everything. And we see this in the rapid collapses of uh, realized and implied volatility, whereby there is that same kind of flywheel effect, both to the upside and the downside. And, and flow dynamics count for a lot because it's not a market in which there's continuous uptime of two-way participation on both sides of the market for every given strike on the surface. And, and as a result, right. it means that if you or long or short a given strike, you're going to, in many cases, if particularly if you're a dealer, you know, you're going to end up needing to dynamically hedge it if you don't want to cross a large spread, a relatively large spread to get out of it, notwithstanding the great improvement in liquidity on Deribit itself, and certainly the great enhancement to that liquidity um, you know, via paradigm. The reality is just that it's, it's not capital efficient in order you know, to, to manage a book of risk to simply trade out of stuff for back-to-back -back flows. And so as a result, people tend to warehouse, in my view, right, based on the flows that we see, people tend to warehouse um, fixed strike risk, and they tend to trade around those fixed strikes 
as opposed to dynamically moving strikes in and out of their book, which would tend to give you this, this more of a floating dynamics, which is also why we see sort of pronounced shifts between you know, the, the age-old dialectic of sticky strike versus sticky delta ball dynamics, because it really depends whether people are holding on to something or whether people are dynamically hedging you know, a spot around it or trading out of those. So, so yes, and there's clearly a lot of good data on this. There are many data providers that have gotten into the game of analyzing strike topography and, and OI and what that means. There are even more sophisticated takes on it now, trying to estimate how much of the OI is short, how much is long, is it dealers, is it takers, um, and what are the behaviors of, of the holders of those positions around that strike. And in that sense, right, again, kind of coming back to why this is an interesting asset class, it is very game theoretic, I find, right? When I, when I sit and look and trade this asset class, I think... The, the application of game theoretic constraints to many financial markets is often overstated. There are a lot of people that say, well, hey, if you're a great poker player, you'll make a great options player or vice versa. I think a lot of times that's just not true um, you know, be, because the games occur in completely different circumstances. I might argue if you're a great backend player, right, you, you could be a great options trader or vice versa. Um, but, but when it comes to crypto, I do think it is more like that because you know, I'm, I'm sitting in a room right now with, um, you know, with, with eight chairs around a table. That's what the crypto ball market feels like trading a lot of the time, right? Which is to say, you know who you're trading against. And, and quite literally, if you're counting cards, you're going to be able to understand with a reasonably high degree of probability what positions are and the certainty you have about other folks' positions. Uh, and that informs you know, the, the kinds of risk management decisions that you make. It is highly conditional, right? Based, based upon the information that is available in the markets, which is really getting better and better. And so that gamma effect, 100% matters, doesn't matter all the time. And I would say matters less when liquidity gets better and there is more taker participation. Because when that happens, right, you tend to see more of the two-way flow at a greater number of strikes across the surface. Right. I, I think where people kind of get like caught up with it is when you think about like dynamically hedging deltas to, to, manage, to manage your gamma. Where it's like, oh, okay, like I need to rebalance my deltas and you know, maybe I need to trade you know, 5 million uh, of spot in order to do so. Like, how, how would that volume that seems very small like in comparison to you know, the spot market like actually meaningfully be able to move the spot market higher? Like, is this just like a function you know, of low order, order book liquidity at top of book? Like, it, it, it's something that when I came into to this market, it, you know, I certainly struggled. Yeah, no. yeah, crypto. I would say, looking at it, you you observe volumes that were traded on exchanges like FTX, that are traded on exchanges like Binance for derivatives, linear derivatives, I should say. And you look at spot exchanges like your Krakens, Coinbase, Bitstamps, and and I should say those those mentioning of names is neither an endorsement for or against the use of those products or services. There are many many exchanges out there, and mentioning those as a representative heuristic sample. Um, but the reality is that transacting significant size, even in linear products is far, um, I would say, is far trickier than the gross volumes that are traded. And a lot of that has to do with how crypto participation happens and, and how people are sort of involved on both sides of the bid and ask and, and you know, kind of who is moving markets. But yes, $5 million of um, directional risk in a linear derivative or, or even a spot product in crypto is more material than it would be in other markets because sort of liquidity has a bit of a sort of a vaporware element to it, which is it's there, but not necessarily at the perceived price on the screen. I think that's especially true for vol, but it's certainly true in the linear space. Um, and we've seen liquidity change over time too. I mean, you know, it, it can't be overstated the extent to which an enterprise like FTX was responsible for a huge portion of global crypto liquidity. And as a result, dynamics within the market, including, um, you know, hedging delta risk have obviously changed and they will change, right? If there were to be a resurrection of an FTX style exchange as a competitor or as a peer to Binance or the emergence of such a linear derivatives product hedging facility on an existing exchange. Whereas, you know, Coinbase, for instance, if they were to roll out or continue to develop things like perpetual futures markets and in a bunch of their products. And so that, that will influence it as well. But, but truly, um, you are a world away from essentially assuming zero slippage hedging costs, um, you know, in, in, in the linear land as you would be in equities or Forex, right? I mean, I, as I said, I cut my teeth in a Forex world. You're talking about two to three basis points of, um, you know, a bid-ask spread 
in maybe $100 million of value at times in something like euros or yen. Um, and even in illiquid emerging market forex, it might only be 10 to 15 basis points. In crypto, the tick vol um, can be far more significant than that. I think a statistic that I saw on Friday when Bitcoin was absolutely ripping you know, was, was that Bitcoin was moving uh, or ticking around 20 basis points per second, right? Um, and, and so that is absolutely going to, to dictate, right, one, the price of, of volatility products and also the decisions that people make about um, dynamically hedging those in linear land. Do you think, uh, Gordon, do you think on that, I mean, obviously, we've had a couple of um, sort of big weekend pumps in crypto. Do, do you think um, guys kind of knowing that and, and knowing there's short gamma positions out there and that dynamic hedging uh, relationship kind of target those those illiquid periods over weekends to kind of trigger some of that and, and force force guys into sort of chasing it? Yes, it could happen. I, I can't speak to whether uh, I know of it happening or, or I believe that it does happen, but I can say it could happen. Um, it's certainly been an observed phenomenon in much larger markets like Forex, right, where you have known barriers, um, known strike exposure that are in the market or that have been made known through interdealer, um, you know, price discovery mechanisms, and you, you trade to those pins, you trade to those barriers. Quite clearly in crypto, and we see the incidence of large fixed strike appetite coinciding with significant movements in, in spot. And I would say either sort of simultaneously or almost preemptive it has the appearance of, you know, of a preemptive nature. And you know, crypto participation, I think, is different than, than other kinds as well, right? Which, which is simply to say people evaluate risk differently than, than they do in other asset classes because we're still nascent, right, as, as, a, as a silo, right? We're not, not everybody sitting around the table, the, the metaphorical table that I've mentioned, has 20 years of experience trading options at an institutional level, right? They may have gotten into the crypto space within the last five years. They may have accumulated a significant degree of capital or raised that capital in a very short amount of time and are deploying it in a relatively new space with, I would say, a lesser degree of, of experience or a more permissive set of risk controls than, than would be present if you were talking about a TradFi um, bulge bracket financial institution. And I believe that also informs things, right? To say you have someone sitting on half a yard or a yard of capital um, that may or may not have a risk manager uh, that's going to tap them on the shoulder if they bust over some kind of delta, gamma, or vega limit, and, and someone that's just simply willing to make large concentrated bets because that's you know how they got where they are, or that's their their ethos as an, as, as a money manager, and they may have consenting capital that backs them to do that, but that's very different from from tradfi where there are a limited number of people that can make those kinds of bets. Um, and especially in sizes that would affect the markets in, in which they are. And that comes back to your original observations about scale, right? All of a sudden, 50 or 100 million of AUM in this asset class, you know, the, the, the conversion factor of the similar size meaning in TradFi is literally geometric, right? It, it might be a power of 10 or more when you, when you talk about TradFi. Yeah. And, and it seems like the most like reflexive and flows and, and the ones that are able to bully the market, you know, the most, you know, it tends to be from those guys that seem to have like this unlimited war chest of like being able to, you know, to spend on, you know, outright calls. So I, I think, I think that that totally resonates of, you know, why we do see this, this re reflexivity in the market. But moving on here, Gordon, I want to get your view on all this, on all this you know, gamma selling, straddle selling that we've been seeing. So for everybody on the screen who's watching, there was an insane amount of straddle selling and short dated this week, you know, as the spot action started to die off, you know, we were, we're actually, you know, joking with Gordon and some of his colleagues in chat, like that all this selling is just killing all the momentum in this market. I mean, you just look at these prints, right? 1100 of the Feb 10, 23,000 sold, you know, a thousand of the Feb 20 Ks, another thousand of the Feb 23 Ks. And, you know, the 27 Jan one was particularly interesting, uh, as we discussed, you know, on Monday, those 27 Jans were trading in, you know, the high, the high 60s. And then we started seeing the selling pressure on these later in the afternoon. And it turned out to be a hell of a sale. I mean, if you just look at that right picture, you know, that those Jan 27s are now trading at a 51 vol, right? So, I mean, clearly had a large impact on the curve. 
you know, along with the lethargic realize and kind of just goes into previous discussions that we've had around how like the vol of all in this market is so crazy. So like, Gordon, what's your view? Is vol selling back? Is this going to kill all the fun in the market? Um, I, I do uh, think it's, or are we going to get carried yeah, out? Yeah. Yeah. I do think it's back. Um, and, and we should expect that. I'm, a bit surprised that it's come in the form of straddles uh, as as opposed to outright selling of calls. I, I would have expected net net all else equal more explicit overwriting. And in fact, it, it's been a bit of the opposite in the sense that most of the optionality demand has not been local to spot. I think if you look at the flows that have appeared on Paradigm, there were a huge amount of call spread buyers into the rally. There were also a significant amount of wing call buyers, right? Guys that are picking up inside of one month, um, you know, sub 20 delta type options. But when it comes to what people have elected to sell, they are selling very meaty uh, at the money type um, options and, and particularly shorter dated ones. It was interesting to see that the March at the money straddles for RFQ today didn't trade, but a more, um, you know, let's say a robust bid was shown for, for the Fed dates. And that's what was given again, quite, quite aggressively. If you look at the break evens for this trade, it's not hard to see why uh, a taker might find it appetizing, right? You're selling an option that, that has a downside break even of somewhere around, um, you know, 20,000 and, and an upside break even that is above the post crisis highs of Bitcoin. And, and so sort of optically at an overall level, it, you can rationalize why someone might do this. Um, and, and I think that there are sound reasons for it. I do feel, though, that at this level of Bitcoin prices, it's not as easy a sale, right? And we know from the, the start of the bull market, which was arguably, you know, kind of coming off the, the bottom, uh, you know, the COVID bottom, there were periods in which volatility languished tremendously, but they didn't last very long. And they didn't last very long because Again, with that flywheel effect, higher prices beget more involvement, beget greater demand for optionality. And as a result, selling vol, you know, a straddle, a, a one month straddle around these kind of 13 percent type levels seems optically appealing. But the reality is you have to kind of think about really what you're selling. And, and you're selling an option that is priced according to a model that values volatility in some sort of log normalized sense, even if we're making modifications to um, a parameterized surface that attempts to account for this in some way. At the end of the day, you know, the, the pricing that appears on, on sort of paradigm reference prices or, uh, or Deribit is still based on a Black-Scholes model, you know, most of the time. We can talk on a later podcast about how we think those parameterizations happen and who's making them and what kind of TradFi trading background they come from. That's a very interesting topic. Um, but suffice it to say, you may end up making the wrong assumptions about volatility, both to the upside and downside, right, when, when you're trading this. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that that does, you know, bear in mind when, when you're stepping in to make a decision, uh, you know, whether to buy or sell vol or managing a book of risk about trading it, that um, vol being today sort of bid at 56 and a half, 57 for Feb dates and having been, you know, bid yesterday at, at 61 or 62 – doesn't really tell us a whole lot other than that's where, where the marginal um, propensity of dealers to take down risk is because tomorrow Bitcoin could actually just move like 15% in either direction, quite literally, right? And it, it doesn't, it's not a, it's not a six standard deviation event to get a, a one day 10% move in Bitcoin. So, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, not, we're not dealing with no, no, distribution no, we are not. And, and I think that, you know, look, there's been some very interesting statistical results, including those that were published by Amber Data about the profitability of, of selling um, certain tenors of straddles over a period of time using a dynamic hedging strategy, which, you know, generate a reasonable amount of excess risk, um, you know, premium and returns associated with them. That also assumes a certain ability to hedge in real time. And I would argue that as we've seen in the move up, right? You, you don't have this kind of, you know, sort of brownie in motion, wiener process based, um, you know, sort of zero drift regime. That's just not how we operate in crypto. And so um, crypto, quite literally, we could get stuck to this 23 level and realize at seven to eight percent annualized for days at a time. And that's what we saw in December when there was a large um, amount of uh, volatility supply and a low degree of interest but we can also have these large breakout events. 
Um, and I think the other thing that, that you know, sort of bears keeping in mind, and, and I can certainly say we've seen this, which is the lower volatility gets at higher levels of crypto prices, there are takers that are going to look at it and say, hey, you know what, at 50% implied vol, I will just load the boat. And so it's less of a one-way street as opposed to at 15K Bitcoin with volatility down at 50 or even 40 in the front month, people simply don't have the balance sheet or the appetite to load up on this stuff. And so it does become more sort of reflexive downside, whereas I would argue at current prices, there's more of a two-way level. So vol selling is back. We know that, that volatility selling under certain back tests can generate tremendous excess returns. We know that there are funds in the crypto landscape that have done well selling uh, volatility as a programmatic strategy, notwithstanding, you know, 50 plus percent periodic drawdowns. And that's what makes it a great two-way market, right? I mean, I, I think you know, it, it remains to be seen. There's a huge amount of event risk on the calendar. We've got, um, you know, uh, GDP, PCE, jobless claims, uh, you know, coming up in the immediate days. We've got FOMC next week. We've got CPI after that. Um, you know, the, the crypto market beta to those sorts of releases and the implications to, to things like interest rates and equity markets has certainly declined since, you know, more of the bear market trading days. But, um, you know, I, I would argue that Selling vol at the local lows is less of a, of a clear call than, um, you know, the kind of letting it go when it's, when it's at 70. And that seems a bit tautological, but, but that is crypto, right? You get greater supply of vol at the lows and greater demand at the highs. There is not a um, economically classical uh, supply-demand curve uh, type of intersection in, in this market. It is very much the opposite. With that, I think it's um, a great opportunity to segue into the macro stuff. Uh, that's it for me. I'll stop sharing. But I'm, I'm, right, I'm, David, I'm you're up. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say, I'm sat here listening to this. Like, fascinating, Gordon. Um, like, really interesting. Uh, just sort of getting your take on it. <laughs> Enjoying this conversation. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, that's no, great. Uh, from, from the macro side, I mean, uh, not, not, not a lot's changed in terms of how I'm viewing things. I mean, if I think of how I look at crypto through a macro framework and the things that I think are driving things, rates, liquidity, dollar, risk and flows, I think those things are all trending um, the, the way I'd like to see a continuation in, in the rally. So, you know, we're seeing rates uh, still trend lower. Uh, we're seeing liquidity starting to improve, uh, both with the TGA drawdown um, as the US hit their debt ceiling. Um, and also you're seeing uh, the Bank of China, uh, PBOC and Bank of Japan balance sheet expansion outpaced that of the Fed and the ECB. So liquidity is improving. Uh, the dollar sat on the lows, lowest level since like June of last year um, and looks like it's going to sort of break to, to new lows again. Um, risk looks pretty stable, right? Uh, VIX sat on a, a low 20 handle. Um, so risk looks pretty, pretty steady. Um, and then flows, you know, um, I've been talking about market being under positioned um, for, for, for risk generally. We've seen that from surveys over the last uh, sort of week or so. And we're seeing that in, in some of our flows come into this market, right, P particularly posi positioning for the top side and, and call spreads. So I, I think there's a real um, there's a real kind of macro dynamic driving this market. I don't see it as a, a sort of bear market rally. Um, I think the consolidation in price that we're having is is uh, constructive. Um, and I, I think as we sort of move through the Fed next week, um, I think we're forming a nice sort of base here to then take the next leg higher. So yeah, feeling constructive, uh, and I, I think the macro uh, is 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 kind of supporting these moves that we've seen so far this year. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree there. I mean, we, you know, we've seen a, a big leadership in gold uh, amongst the commodity complex, and although the correlation between Bitcoin and gold has varied widely and wildly over periods of time, um, you know, there, there is some propensity there to, uh, to associate or prognosticate, um, you know, kind of future asymmetric upside um, to, you know, to Bitcoin possibilities, given that gold is trading back in 1900, you know, and last year, with, for, you know, the macro space was, was a bit of a curious year, right, because we saw a significant unwind of some of these code era liquidity trades, gold got absolutely dashed trading back below 1700. Um, you know, you saw higher beta plays like silver trade down from 27, 28 to 17, right? So pretty, pretty vicious unwind there for a obviously more retail driven product. And, and Bitcoin, of course, factored into that mix. And in some cases, its, it's uh, return performance was way worse. Those assets have indeed come back. Gold has had a major resurgence back uh, for a very obvious reason, which is a huge amount of central bank buying. 
right? This is out in the press. It's been reported that everyone from, you know, the Uzbek Central Bank, which is a relatively smaller Central Asian Central Bank, which produces its, its own, um, you know, gold and buys it from its own domestic producers to the Russians, to, to others, people are at a macro level quite clearly looking at other dollar alternatives. This is a fact, right? Um, we've seen States ranging from, um, you know, sanctioned states like Russia and Iran who are talking about forming their own currency, right, um, backed by some kind of other asset. In the case of Iran and Russia, they've talked about doing the gold-backed currency. Argentina and Brazil talking about having their own currency, right, for the purposes of trade. We have seen um, relatively more fringe players like the Central African Republic uh, adopt Bitcoin, right, as, as an actually, um, you know, an, an officially accepted payment methodology. And, you know, you can question whether these are memes. I think the El Salvador exercise has been largely laughed at. But I can say, having toured, um, you know, toured the world, you know, reasonably well in, in 2022 and talked to a wide variety of players, the diversification impetus and, and we can talk about whether that implicates crypto directly or indirectly, is strong. And the ability to use decentralized ledger uh, technology, you know, blockchain in that process is also strong, right? Um, central bank digital currencies may or may not immediately implicate the use of blockchain technology, probably from your more established players like the ECB, um, they're, they're less likely to of necessity. And certainly from the Fed, they would be less likely to. But we know that other such projects, including the sand dollar, including the digital red and B are out there. Um, and we know that real trade is, is actually happening in crypto. And so I, I kind of come back to way back when, where this all got started and why people were so excited about crypto and, and, and crypto and Bitcoin in particular, um, you know, is this interesting uh, crystallized teardrop that sits at the nexus of the price of data and money and, and energy. And I think now, as the world is staring down the barrel of a gun at decarbonization, the um, attempts to achieve net zero carbon emissions for the global economy by 2040, as well as wrangling with the effects of a geopolitical decision that's been taken by the small L, small D, liberal, democratic Western bloc to boycott or otherwise cap consumption of Russian hydrocarbons. Um, this is a decision. This is a policy. It's a policy that is no more or less um, official than, uh, let's say, uh, quantitative tightening by the Federal Reserve. It is a decision. There is a consequence that comes with it. And part of the consequence of that policy is that on the margin, the acceptance of dollars is likely to be less, right? And as the acceptance of dollars in the macro world is likely to be less, people start to ask the question, not necessarily uh, to say that they would use Bitcoin immediately as a transnational payment mechanism for things like hydrocarbons or other goods, but people ask, what are my alternatives? And the more people start to ask, the stronger that narrative is. And there is the potential, right, for, for reflexivity. There's also the potential for um, energy surplus countries to think about monetizing the value of their state reserves in the form of cryptocurrency. It's a choice. You can today take a look at the economics of um, proof of work mining, be it for Bitcoin or some other token, and, and determine what your internal rate of return is at current hash prices, difficulty, um, and uh, you know global hash rates as well as the price of Bitcoin. And thanks to these great, wonderful liquid derivatives markets that we're trading in, you can hedge it. Um, and, and you can arrive at a dollarized rate of return that effectively only depends um, you know, on, on the difficulty and hash rate of global market, assuming that you depreciate your rigs to zero. This is fascinating, right? And this is a real conversation that's going on out there. And I think that, that people need to, to pay attention to that. And I, I do think it's part of the narrative. Coming back to where I started this about the macro, again, no specific insight here, you know, have not had any conversations to this effect. But going back to, you know, what really engendered a sea change in a market like gold and, um, you know, what took that kind of out of, out of the, you know, crisis doldrums and, and gave it a leg up as this new de facto flag bearer for the anti-dollar asset class. It was when India stepped up and bought the IMF gold, right, around the time of the GFC. And every time we've seen a material transfer of gold as an asset from a longer term, low conviction holder to a shorter term, high conviction buyer, 
that has spurred a new leg up in the asset class, right? There was the so-called uh, brown bottom in gold, right? When the Bank of England dumped all of their gold at $250 an ounce. And, and that was literally it, right? And it took off from there. Then there was the IMF, uh, you know, liquidation, the sale to India at whatever the price was, just under $1,000 an ounce at that time, maybe seven fifty, eight hundred, dollars and, and then gold had a double. What if a sovereign state investment uh, arm were to be thinking about Bitcoin as an allocation, right? What, what would the return distribution of Bitcoin look like if we were to find out sometime over the course of 2023 that PIF... KIA, QIA, or ADIA, or ADQ, or you know any of these other uh, GIC alphabet soup, you know sovereign wealth funds, were even to be looking at Bitcoin, right? And and I think I think we all kind of know what that would look like, and um, that to me feels more real as a possibility than than it has ever felt, given the macro conditions that you've elucidated. Yeah, and and, and I, I think that's the thing, right? That's you know, in, in my conversations with people, it, it's kind of like, you know, you've got a low delta call option on this potential future state, future state of the world. Um, you know, size it accordingly to, to a portfolio that, that you can stomach the volatility. But yeah, like you, you, you're long Bitcoin and sort of crypto generally, you're, yeah, you have this sort of call option on the potential state of the world. Because like you say, if that, if that head, headline breaks, then, man, um, you, you, you're going to struggle to get into that trade. <laughs> so yeah. you just you just like the the last like 10 minutes of monologue there, there was so much to unpack. You mentioned so many interesting things that I want to ask you questions about. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't think we have enough time. But but I do want to go back to one thing you said, um, like I, I have an economist friend in Argentina and I've been there um, a few times and we've talked a lot about like what the state of um, their currency is. And so like two years ago, I wrote about regional currencies or like a regional currency that was a basket of currencies that could potentially be backed by Bitcoin. What are your thoughts around that? Um, Argentina is a very cool use case. And let's set a little bit of macro context there. Um, and, and I hope maybe we'll have an opportunity to have a bit more of a multi-plenary forum about this discussion with some other informed persons at a later time. But if you think about sort of why crypto has survived um, you know, and, and expanded to where it is today, some people would argue it's, it's because the conventional policy mix from both the emerging and developed world has been so rotten for so long. Right? So Argentina, you know, to, to give them credit for, for many wonderful things that they do, including tango and soybeans and winning the World Cup and all that stuff, they may, they, they may have saved crypto. In part, right? I mean, quite literally, Argentina, Ukraine, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and other jurisdictions, Nigeria, have put a bid under crypto that never existed before, right? Because if you live in a place like Argentina, whereby you know that in any given day, the official transactable rate of the currency may devalue by 50% or more, 100% in, in some cases, um, and, and the street rates can move as much. You don't think so very badly of holding Bitcoin, which has 70% annualized volatility. Doesn't feel like a bad trade-off, right? You can take it anywhere with you. Your pesos, you can't exchange them anywhere. So, so this idea, all of a sudden, of a regional currency board that is backed by Bitcoin doesn't seem irrational. Is it immediately implementable? There are policy-related reasons why that may not happen as quickly as it should, right? We've seen these sovereign crypto initiatives before. Believe it or not, in 2017, late 2017, it's, it's sort of a, a piece of crypto arcana. Venezuela came out with a, a cryptocurrency called the Petro, right? And this was a Nicolas Maduro-sponsored uh, idea whereby there was some loose affiliation of the value of assets under the ground in Venezuela and this cryptocurrency. No one knew what blockchain it was on and what its degree of fungibility would be. Um, there, there was sort of, you know, barely an ERP-20 kind of standard at the time. And, and I doubt that Venezuela really got that far along in their analysis. But no, needless to say, Venezuela was sanctioned to oblivion and the idea never took off. But now, as we sit here, this is very much a realistic possibility, right? For uh, a, a community a market like Mercosur, right, um, in, in Latin America to say, or Andean countries to say, hey, you know what? Um, we, we can implement this in a number of ways, including communal Bitcoin mining, 
right? Whereby we translate surplus energy, which most of these countries have, or other energy fungible commodities, into producing Bitcoin, which goes into a treasury, um, you know, which, which sort of backs in whole or in part by faith and credit this this regional currency board. And what if we actually set some kind of you know um, Bitcoin standard for those? It's entirely achievable. Um, and in a time now where dollar access is harder. AML KYC regulations, even for friendly jurisdictions or jurisdictions that used to be considered friendly, had never been more difficult. Um, people like the idea of having an alternative, right? Um, it's it's not it's not obvious to me that if you look at you know West African jurisdictions like Nigeria or Angola or economically complex jurisdictions in, in Latin America like in Ecuador, like a Bolivia, like an Argentina, like a Venezuela. Um, that you would be opposed to this de facto and say, you know what, I would just really rather have dollars. I think as a policymaker, uh, especially as a younger policymaker, and there is a younger bent to the policymaker mix in these countries, right, who are under 50 years old, maybe under 40 years old, who understand what blockchain is, what proof of work is. Um, I, I think there is an increasing likelihood that some of this experimentation um, you know, may well take hold, right? In the same way that there's been a tremendous degree of sort of medical grade experimentation in uh, in Western monetary and fiscal policy, particularly since the pandemic and, and more so since the global financial crisis, we should expect this to happen in some of these jurisdictions as well. And, and I think that's part of the narrative, right? And, and it may well bring two-way volatility to the asset class. It will certainly bring more activity in the hedging space. And the role of derivative markets in facilitating that kind of participation is going to be very key, right? There's, there's no doubt in my mind. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> and that's yeah. why we're oh, here. One and last question, like going back, to, going back to Bitcoin mining, I have a friend who runs um, a couple of Bitcoin uh, mobile mines and they, they use flared gas um, to do that. And it's, it's, it's really interesting, really cool, and probably another a topic for another time. But you were talking about like different... Um, sovereign wealth funds holding Bitcoin or p potentially even mining Bitcoin. Um, do you think, if you were to speculate, that Russia is actually mining Bitcoin and holding Bitcoin? I would say, uh, you know, let, let's work backwards from a few statistics. So I was reading a good report today about Kazakhstan and, and the, the decrease in the hash rate, um, uh, the percentage share of hash rate in Kazakhstan, which at its peak post-China exodus was almost 20%. And the report was touting the fact that the hash rate in Kazakhstan has collapsed and, and fallen now to, you know, below 8%, maybe below 6%. And of course, this was um, trumpeted by folks who uh, are, are proponents of a greener mining regime is to say that, you know, basically most of Kazakhstan's mining came from, um, you know, hydrocarbon sources, some thermal coal and, and some, you know, burning mazut and ever, or other forms of heavy fuel oil, which are obviously not what, um, uh, what, what anybody wants to see in terms of reducing the carbon footprint of mining. So. Kazakhstan, uh, you know, sits on the Caspian Sea um, in, in an area of the world kind of known as Central or, or West Asia. And, and its closest neighbors um, are who? Its closest neighbors are uh, Russia to, to the north, Azerbaijan uh, to the west, Iran to the south across the Caspian Sea, and China to the east. Um, putting mining rigs in containers um, is possible if it's seaborne shipping, but of course, Kazakhstan, I think, is what's known as a doubly landlocked country. So not very obvious that their mining rigs would have, would have gone into cargo containers. And um, so when you look as to where all that hash, hash power went, you can ask China, and, and China still has very severe bans on cryptocurrency mining, and I think is pretty well monitored and, and understood as to how much mining could be happening in China. Um, so it really doesn't leave that many possibilities. And if you go by a process of elimination, it, it really would, would basically exclude Azerbaijan. It's a smaller country. It does have some surplus energy, but their, uh, their grid is tightly controlled by, um, I, I guess you would call somewhat of a, of a, um, a monarchic um, you know, governance structure by the Aliyev family. And, and I think if they were in Bitcoin mining, it probably would have been talked about. And, and so that really just leaves you with Russia and Iran as to places that, that the rigs would have gone from a logistical standpoint. And then the final step down from that is well, what's your cost of power? And when you look at the cost of power, quite incidentally, Russia and Iran also happen to be number one and number two in global gas reserves, um, you know, quite, quite literally by a factor of almost two from the next highest ranking power. So I think, you know, um, Iran is like 
1.2 trillion uh, BCF and, and Russia is maybe 1.3 or 4 in terms of proven reserves. So what that means is, especially now that they're sanctioned countries, they have all this excess gas domestically and they got to figure out what to do with it. Um, and, and then you put the last piece of the puzzle together, which is magically, um, you know, right now in the midst of a very cold winter in a place like Iran, they're reporting um, severe uh, gas and electricity shortages in certain parts of the country that normally should be amply supplied. And people are sort of batting their heads and saying, like, well, how come I don't have gas to heat my home? I mean, this stuff is basically free here. So putting all those together, right, I, I leave you to your own conclusions. But I think it, it would be it would be um, uninformed to opine that some of the mining hardware from Kazakhstan has not made its way to neighboring countries, um, and and particularly those that find themselves less able or unable to access the global financial system have surplus energy that can be monetized and have a reasonable degree of, of financial and technological sophistication with lots of otherwise unemployed engineering graduates who might be able to do things with those kinds of rigs. So that's my answer to the question. All right. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, closing, I'll leave it to you guys. Closing <laughs> thoughts. So Joe, do you want to, do you want to wrap up or um, yeah, just go for it. Yeah. I mean, I guess the main takeaway is, you know, compared to December where it was just a brutal market, market makers trading against market makers, not a good way for anybody to make money that has significantly decreased in, in the month of January. And, and we couldn't be more happy uh, to see that the taker interest is back. But that being said, fair amount of, of gamma and vol supply now coming into the market. Hopefully that does not stop the momentum. We'll see. David. Yeah, I just think from my side, um, say I think the macro dynamic is supportive of, of this move that we've seen throughout the start of the year. It continues to um, support it. Uh, the moves are unfolding. If I look at rates, liquidity, dollar, risk and flows. Um, so I think this kind of consolidation uh, correction we're having in price just now is constructive. Um, I expect it to be a little bit like that um, into the... Sorry. Sorry, I'm back. Sorry about that. Yeah, you're back. Do you... Uh, I'm back. back like he never left. <laughs> so I'm yeah. back now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, should, should, I, should I wrap that up again in terms of... Yeah, just, just wrap it up. Thinking? I cut, I'll cut it up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so I, I think my final takeaway is that um, I think the sort of macro dynamic driving this rally we've had in, in, in crypto to start the year um, is, is still sort of continuing, looking at rates, liquidity, dollar, risk, flows... Um, so I think the, the consolidation we're having in price is, is constructive. Um, obviously, Fed next week is going to be a big event. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, the, the macro is still pointing to further upside. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see that past the Fed. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Gordon, I have a million questions for you. So maybe we, <laughs> should, we should do this again. I'll, but um, I'll leave it to you. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts on everything we just talked about? Vols, whatever you want to say. Yeah, um, you know, look, as, as a, a, a derivatives options market maker, someone that, that really doesn't live too much in the Delta space and, and focuses mostly on uh, Vega and some of the higher order Greeks, I, I guess I would say taking a look at everything net net all else equal, uh, I continue to, to believe that vol of vol is, um, is, is probably underestimated, is probably um, less appropriately priced than some of the more fair value mechanisms for um, you know, vol risk premium as measured by at the money straddles across the term structure. And I tend to believe that the ramp up in, in spot and the commensurate moving vol that we saw since the 10th of January is, um, is probably not done. The contraction that we've seen over recent days has once again been breathtaking and, um, you know, is, is proof positive that this is an asset class to be involved in, that there are great two way trading opportunities to be had in crypto vol and that, um, you know, there, there's certainly the, the potential for the rapid expansion of, um, you know, kind of vols and, and skew and convexity across the surface. And, you know, I, I do believe that 2023 will probably prove the adage once again that, um, 
you never know uh, exactly what to expect in, in crypto, and, and I think you have to be positioned for that if you if you know if you really want to be involved in this asset class. So very much looking forward to what the year ahead has to bring, and, and hopefully we'll have a chance to get on some more podcasts and wrap about that with you guys. That was perfect. That was perfect. Well, thank you guys for uh, hanging out, talking with us, and we'll wrap it up here.